Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, we're going to continue tonight in our study of the book of John. Now, if you have not seen the previous episodes, I, I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning. Uh, it's always a good idea to get the context, uh, but particularly on this book here, the book of John, the, the first few verses are just amazing. There's some of the most important verses in the whole Bible. So I hope you will go back and watch it from John chapter 1, verse 1, and get caught up. But tonight we're going to pick up where we left off. And I let me see, I forgot where we are. Uh, let me see, it's John chapter, uh, ch we're, chapter 1, verse 26 is where we're where we are. But first, let me ask uh, Brother Eric to say hi to everybody, and then we'll get started. Hello, everybody. It's me again, the homo. D-E-H-A-L-L-M-O. It's great to be here. And I'm looking forward to learning a lot about uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay, stay tuned. All right, brother. <clears throat> As I've said many times, uh, uh, Brother Joe Byron coined a term for me, and he says I am KJV firstist. So it's my custom to always look at the KJV first, but I'm not a KJV onlyist. I'm not against looking at other translations if I think it might help me. So we'll look at the KJV, and if I think it's necessary, we'll probably go look at the Amplified or a commentary, or maybe I'll ask just Brother Eric to explain a verse to me but we're in the gospel according to john chapter 1 verse 26 and they which were sent were of the pharisees and they asked him and said unto him why baptizest thou then if thou be not that christ nor elias neither that prophet um, okay, brother, let me ask you to respond to, to, to that. And also, if you can, kind of catch everybody up uh, on the previous verses in terms of the context here. Okay, brother Luke. Now, uh, as you recall, we were uh, discussing uh, about uh, John the Baptist and the Pharisees came to him and were wanting to know who he was. And he denied being Jesus, and he denied being Elijah. Interestingly enough, though, uh, Jesus said he was Elijah. Uh, what do you make of that, Brother Luke? Hmm. Okay. Um well, when we look at uh, verses uh, 21, uh, it, he's asked the question, what then? Uh, are thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Then they ask him, are thou that prophet? And he said, no. And then they asked him, well, who are you then? And he says, he's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Uh, so, but when he asked him, they asked him, art thou Elias and art thou that prophet? The way that the Amplified translates that, I think could be helpful. Amplified. Okay, so we go. Um, um, verse 21, they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? Uh, yeah, so they 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 translate Elias as Elijah, uh, and he said, "I am not." He says, "Are you the promised prophet?" And he said, "No." So we know that you're you were asking a good question because Jesus said that he is Elijah. See they. They thought that they thought that Elias was going to come come back again. 
uh, the pro the prophecies talks about um, Elijah coming at, at the time of the Messiah. Uh, I guess they think he's the one that's going to introduce the Messiah. But uh, as as Jesus uh, when identifies him as Elijah, uh, when we get to that point, I think we're going to end up concluding that he's not Elijah coming back like we we saw in the, in the transfiguration uh, on, on the on the mountain when Jesus was there. Uh, I think it was uh, Peter, John, and Andrew were watching, and then Jesus had was transfigured and he had Elijah and Moses there with him and he had a conversation and then the father even spoke and said quiet listen to my son stop asking these questions about building a tabernacle and just listen to him this is my beloved son listen to him so we'll get to that point on the transfiguration but we in that case we did have Elijah and Moses appear now did they appear in the flesh um, I don't know. Uh, maybe it was a, just a spiritual thing, or maybe it was a vision, and uh, just a vision of them. I I don't know how. Um, maybe when we get to that point, we can try to figure it out better. But I know that uh, you know I I grew up on a family that believed in the occult, and they 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 believed in reincarnation and all the occult. They did Ouija boards. They did. Uh, uh, card readings they did horoscopes they would even do seances and and hypnosis where they think they were going back into previous lives uh, so uh, that was my experience and I know that the people who come from that belief system they will use the verse that uh, when uh, Jesus says that uh, John the Baptist is Elijah they use that to prove that uh, see, reincarnation is true. He was Elijah, and now he's John the Baptist. That's reincarnation. But I, I think when we get to that point, we're jumping ahead. I think we're going to be able to see that he's there in the spirit of Elijah. He's, he's preaching in the same style as Elijah did. And that it's the style of preaching or the spirit of preaching uh, that it's not the person Elijah, it's the spirit, the the uh, system, methodology, style of Elijah. Uh, let me get your reaction to that before we go go on. Well, Brother Luke, uh, I recall uh, Malachi, the prophet Malachi, in verse 5 of chapter 4, he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now where it says the coming of the great and dreadful, that's two different days. And yet the two days are one. Now the great day was when Jesus came. The dreadful day is yet to come, I believe. Uh, what do you think about that? I don't know, but uh, I was waiting for you to answer about... Uh this uh, John the Baptist because what you just read uh, seems to support the idea that you think John the Baptist was Elijah do you agree with the premise that he's not actually Elijah after all Jesus but Jesus said well, we're jumping ahead right you know way ahead with your question so we're getting this out of the whole context. I, I think we're going to be able to understand it better when we reach that point and get the whole context. Uh, but do you think that I mean, Jesus identified John as Elijah? So you, you now, don't you actually is Elijah, do you? Uh, let me uh, hold on. Uh, no, I've always been taught by my teachers that he was uh after the spirit of Elijah and that, that was acceptable to me and it still is uh, but I uh, uh, I will uh, hold off that question uh, until later on when we fully have uh, searched out the matter okay uh, I see I forgot to do my mute button there while you were talking 
I'm getting a little, it's harder for me to do the mute button and control my lighting too here. <laughs> All right, let me go back to the KJV translation here and look at the, um, pick up where we left off again. So that was verse 25. They asked him, okay, uh, he's, why do you go baptizing? If, if you're not Christ, you're not Elias, you're not that prophet, whoever they think who are referring to with that prophet, uh, they're asking, well, why are you baptizing? And in verse 26, John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is whom, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. Now, it seems to me this, um, this phraseology, this term, terminology, who is preferred before me, is the same uh, terminology. Yeah, if we go back to verse 15, it's the same thing. When John said, John bear witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I connected verse 15 to, to the uh, uh, verse 1 and 2, which shows that Jesus is eternal. Um, but so he's using the same terminology there as this person he's in, going to in, point out to everybody uh, is uh, uh, preferred before me. And he says, whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. So here we have uh, John the Baptist um, being very humble because he was very highly esteemed, not by the Pharisees. They were very skeptical of him. They probably didn't really approve of what he was doing. And they're, here they are trying to question him and find out what kind of authority he has. Uh, and, and yet he says, no, I'm not even worthy to, to take his shoes off, the one that I'm going to point out. Okay, brother? Uh, amen to that. And he even emphasizes that fact with the statement that he's not even worthy to unlatch his shoes, emphasizing the greatness of Jesus Christ. All right, I'm going to look at that verse now in the Amplified. Um, he says, uh, I read that in the Amplified in context. Um, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked, by the way, these Pharisees, you know, you got to keep in mind, these are the extremely religious Jews that are very legalistic. And as we go on, you're going to see Jesus does not approve of them. He condemns them and calls them names. You know, there are some street preachers I know that uh, they, they like to call people names. And they, they say that name calling is an acceptable thing to do. And they, they point out even Jesus called pe people names. Uh, but he doesn't call everybody names. He, he calls the religious hypocrites, the Pharisees. He calls them snakes, vipers, whitewashed tombs, hypocrites. Uh, the only people I see Jesus coming down on like that are these super religious people that he knows are just hypocrites. Uh, but uh, it says, now they have been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing? If you were not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet, John answered them, I baptize only when water, but among you there stands one whom you do not recognize and of whom you know nothing. It is he, the preeminent one, who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie, even as his slave. So with the Amplified, uh, it's like reading a commentary. They're amplifying and expounding on the verse, and we can, we get, it's like if, if I was 
that's what Brother Eric and I have been doing here. We're reading the verse and we're amplifying in our words how we understand the verse. So the writers of the Amplified Version are doing much the same as we are, and that's how they would explain the verse to us. And I think it's uh, it really emphasizing what we've been talking about. It says that uh, it is he, the preeminent one, who comes after me. So uh, he's saying there's someone coming after me, and he's going to point out who it is, and they're preeminent. He says they're so, so great that the strap of whose sandal I'm not even worthy to untie, even his slave. So that's how, how he is elevating this Messiah that he's going to point out, Jesus Christ. He's elevating him to a level of preeminence, and he's, he's uh, humbling himself even to the point of being like a slave, even if he, he's not even worthy to be a slave. That's the... Uh, distinction that the difference he's drawing between him now the pharisees didn't think much of john the baptist but the john the baptist had a very loyal following that thought of greatly and very highly of john the baptist uh but and yet he's he's humbling himself and saying no don't elevate me at all it's the one i'm going to introduce that needs to be elevated um we'll go to verse 28 next uh, but first, let me get your reaction to that translation. Well, Brother Luke, I really like their choice of words with the word preeminent. I think that was a great uh, choice of words on their part. All right. Uh, now I'm going to go back to the, the KJV for the next verse. And it is verse number 28. These things were done in Beth Abara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Uh, let's, let's, let me ask you about baptizing anyway. Um, we know that um, this idea of baptizing, uh, I, I wonder if you can speak about what you know about the origin of it and how it, how it was used in, uh, in uh, Judaism and, and then how, uh, and the types of baptism that we understand as, uh, uh, you know, uh, Christians, not only in the early church, but but today. So let, let's talk about this baptism for a moment here, brother. What, what do you say about it? Well, Brother Luke, uh, it's a very interesting topic, and I highly recommend that everybody watch Aaron Budgen's uh, videos on that topic. Uh, that will... Uh, pretty much cover everything you need to know about baptism and how it ties in with the Old Testament and everything else. Okay, back to you. All right. Um, is, it, is it possible for you to uh, sum up his uh, teachings in uh, a minute or two? <laughs> Not necessarily. I've pretty much forgotten all of that. All right. Well, I, I I will give people my thoughts on it. The uh, uh, in Judaism, there are certain things that people uh, consider to be unclean, like uh, if you were to touch certain food, your certain food that's forbidden. If you touched it, you're unclean. Uh, there are certain uh, if you were to touch a dead body, you'd be unclean, and uh, this baptism was uh they didn't call it baptizing really they just called it uh um, ritual cleansing you know to you need to cleanse yourself because you've got you've touched something unclean so that's how they it's ritual washing they would wash themselves and it was symbolic of 
uh, I think there was partly symbolic and part of it thinking that you really by washing yourself, they were very into hygienics. Uh, matter of fact, I remember there was a time in history when there was a plague going on all over Europe and everybody got the plague except the Jewish people. The Jewish didn't get it because they, they had this, uh, they're very really, uh, ritualistic cleaning, did cleaning and washed all the time. And they washed in running water. The rest of the world didn't use running water. They would wash, wash in, in uh, just a bowl of water. But Jews used running water. And they were, they were instructed to do that in the law. Out of the 613 laws, there are laws telling people exactly how to wash. And uh, back then, we didn't have the science to know about bacteria and, and, and the germs and stuff. But running water is what was needed to really clean yourself and get rid of the bacteria, not standing water. Uh, so there was a practical purpose for this cleansing. And it was also a spiritual purpose too, the symbolic that you're cleansing yourself spiritually from being unclean. Uh, so they didn't call it baptism. I, I don't remember the, if I'm using the right term or not, but it was a kind of ritualistic cleansing with water. Uh, and then John took it and they, they were, they called it baptizing and, and baptize, I think, just translates to immersing, immersion. Matter of fact, uh, there's a YouTube channel, uh, let me see. I think it's, um, I forgot the name of the channel. Maybe I'll recall it in a minute. But uh, this pastor did a very good teaching on uh, on a verse. I think it's Acts 328 is the, is the verse about baptizing. And he said the word should not even be translated um, baptize. It, it should be um, translated as immerse. If you get immersed in something. Uh, now we, we, we think of baptizing being you're immersed, you're submerged, immersed in water. And, and baptism is symbolic of us being, uh, that being dying and then coming out of the water and being resurrected. And, and, and the new birth and the death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, but it, if we look at it as the word being translated as immersed, it's it's like when you believe in Christ, you're you're believing into Him. You're being immersed into Christ. Scripture says, "I am in Christ, and He is in me." And that's what immersion means. We are uh, immersed. We believe. We're baptized into Christ means we're immersed into him, we're become one with him in that sense. Um, but some people teach today, I've talked about this numerous times, some people believe that you must be water baptized to get saved. And this term is called baptismal regeneration. They believe that you are not regenerated your spirit is not brought to life. You're not born again until you get wet. There's some kind of power in the water is what they think. Normally, this is the Church of Christ and Pentecostals. Some of them take that viewpoint. And that's wrong because we get born again. We get regenerated when we put our faith in Jesus. And if you've done that, even before you get in water, you're, you're already regenerated and born again and saved before you ever get wet. And then there's another group of people that are the hyper dispensationalists, the Paulonius. They'll tell you, don't get wet, stay dry, because uh, you, you get saved by faith in Jesus, and you should not put any faith in the water, in the baptism. And if you get baptized, water baptized, then it's a sign that you're not trusting Jesus. You think that there is some work you must do, water baptism. So these two factions go to from one extreme to the other. The... Uh, the Pentecostals, they say you're not saved unless you get wet. And the hyper dispensationalists, they say you better, you're not saved if you get wet because you're putting your faith in water instead of Jesus. You better stay dry. And the truth is that that we we don't have to be water baptized to get saved, but we should. There are certain things that we must do. We must believe on the Lord. And there's other things we should do 
like water baptism, like communion, like loving each other. These are things that we should do to please the Lord, and there's per there's a purpose behind it. But we're not required to do those things to get salvation or to keep our salvation or to prove our salvation. Uh, I might have gone a little farther with that than I wanted there, but brother, what's your reaction to all that? I was wondering, Brother Luke, did you get baptized? Yeah, I I was infant baptized as a child, as a Rome, as growing up in a Roman Catholic family. But that, of course, means nothing because, you know, I wasn't conscious. I didn't make any, uh, any any decision that I wanted to be baptized when I was, you know, a week old or a month old or when, however old I was. But after I uh, was born again, I did get baptized, and my son and I, who was I think five or six years old at the time, we both got water baptized the same day. Uh, but I did it because uh, I wanted to tell the world I'm not ashamed. I mean, matter of fact, when I first came out as a Christian, um, my some people in my family thought it was it was just extreme and weird. I'm what is it? Are you a Jesus freak? You're, you're reading the Bible now, want to do Bible studies, now, and then you're getting baptized. And, and, you know, so to a lot of people, what we do, what we just take for granted as a normal thing, to want to talk about Jesus, want to read the Bible, want to have fellowship with other believers. This is just a normal thing, but uh, most, much of the people think that you're very weird, brother, and I'm weird. We're Jesus freaks in their eyes. But... Uh, taking that first public statement, so I said, I, I want to get baptized publicly. I knew I was already saved. I knew I didn't have to do it, but I wanted to do it because I was kind of shy in the beginning, too. I mean, I wasn't an evangelist as I am now. I never knocked on doors or went on a street corner or made videos or anything. But at least the one thing I could do. I could get water baptized, and that way I let my whole family and friends, everybody know, I now put my faith in Jesus, and this is symbolic of my faith in him. Yeah, I did that, uh, I'd say, probably about three months after after I first uh, believed. How about you, brother? I did too, Brother Luke, and for the same exact reason, I wanted to make a statement. I wanted everybody to know. But that's what happens when you get born again. You want to do that sort of stuff. Okay. <laughs> now, some people, don't, they don't want to do that. Why, why do you suppose uh, some people get saved and they don't want to get baptized? Uh, well, um, there's probably a lot of different reasons, whether it's baptizing or even talking about Jesus. Uh, it's... Uh, I think I've made videos, at least one or two videos over the years, using the term closet Christian. That's a person who put their faith in Jesus, but they never want to talk about it. It's, all, it's a private. They keep it private. And uh, it's a shame. Uh, it's a shame that, I mean, yeah, we need to go and pray in the closet, as Jesus said, because if you're doing out these public prayers, Jesus says, well, you're getting your, your reward now because you're getting public attention. You're getting recognition for your for your goodness, you know. Uh, but he says, go to the closet and pray. And, and then you're not going to get a reward now, but you'll get build up treasures in heaven. But the problem is some people take that so far. They want to keep all of their Christianity in the closet. They don't want to talk about it publicly. Then maybe they'll go to church, but apart from that, don't let's not talk about it. And that that's a shame. And they're they're kind of uh, it's really un, uh, unfortunate. Uh, why do they do it? Probably because they're embarrassed. Jesus said, "Don't be embarrassed or ashamed of me before man, or I'll be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven." That doesn't mean that you're not you're not going to go to heaven. It just means that he, he's ashamed that you. God, you wouldn't even mention my name. You put your faith in me, and all those years went by, and you never told anybody about me. I mean, that, that's shameful. Uh, 
I think that's the reason people, some people just get, they're just embarrassed about it. And it's very unfortunate. All right. I'm going to look at the next verse. Okay. Okay, I got a, I got the mic on again now. I almost made a mistake there. Uh, verse twenty nine. It says, "The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world." Verse thirty. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. So um, yeah, I better read a little further. It says, uh, uh, And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And, and, Okay, so that's verse 31. But the real, really important one there is, is verse 29. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. There's a lot of important information in that verse. Brother, what is your reaction to verse 29? Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a lot in there. The Lamb of God. Now, when... Uh, Abraham was uh, getting ready to sacrifice Isaac, and the angel told him to stop. And, uh, okay, he stopped, and he got Isaac off, and then Isaac said, well, uh, oh, okay, this was before, before the sacrifice. Isaac and Abraham was going up the hill, and Isaac said, uh, where's the lamb that we're going to sacrifice? And Abraham said to Isaac, God will provide himself. A lamb. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, and I think that uh, the way it's written there, too, um, it's very easy to understand that he will provide himself as a lamb. Uh, and, and then we know that the angel tells Abra, Abraham to stop, and he doesn't bring the knife down he stops and he provides a ram there's a ram caught in a thicket his head his horns are caught in the thicket and that that ram is then sacrificed rather than his son um, and it's symbolic of uh, first of all Abraham sacrificing his son and it's a picture of God having his son Jesus sacrificed for our sins uh, but when it says God will provide himself a sacrifice, he's going to provide himself as a sacrifice. And he provided this ram to take the place of uh, Isaac. And I like the, the fact that the ram was caught in the thicket. And that's like Jesus' head wearing the crown of thorns is, is like Jesus was caught in the thicket of thorns. That's, it's a, that ram and being in the thicket is a picture of the thorny crown, I believe. Um, but... Uh, the, the idea of a sacrifice uh, is very ancient. Uh, some people think, you know, they, they can see it in, in, um, in um, Judaism, in the Mosaic laws, the sacrificial system. But as you pointed out, you, see, you saw Abraham doing it. And Abraham was not a Jew, by the way. Most people think that Abraham is a Jew, but Judaism didn't start really until until uh, Moses came down with the law uh, and there were no Jews uh, technically until uh, Jacob God changed his name to Israel and he had 12 sons and most people consider them the, the 12 tribes of Israel but one of them was named Judah 
in his particular family were they called Jews, but most people consider all of the family line as Jews, but there was no Judaism at the time of Abraham. Abraham was not a Jew, he was a Gentile. Um, I believe he was a, a Christian. Matter of fact, I heard someone talking about it today in a video I was watching, that Abraham uh, was a Christian because he believed, and, and uh, Jesus said that well, they were talking about Father Abraham. We're going to come to that probably in one of these future chapters here where uh, they're arguing about uh, their, if Abraham was their father. And Jesus said, uh, said, is talking about Abraham and says, Abraham saw me believe and believe in me. And Abraham did. He saw Jesus. At some point, he must have seen Jesus. And he understood about Jesus, God, and, and, and Jesus being the sacrifice. And I, I believe that was his faith. His faith was not as uh, as general as we think. I think his, his faith was really more specific and narrow. He had more knowledge than a lot of people uh, actually understand. Um, but he certainly was saved because of his faith alone, not because of his works. The, the sacrifices in Judaism, the sacrifices going back to Abraham, even the sacrifices done by when Cain and Abel, uh, Cain slew Abel, but Abel had a good sacrifice. It was a blood sacrifice. God liked it because it was a picture of the blood sacrifice to come in the future, Jesus Christ. Uh, and even the first shedding of blood was the covering that God provided Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, they wanted to, when they realized they were, they sinned and they were naked and they were ashamed and embarrassed, they tried to solve the problem themselves. They got made a covering. They, they got fig leaves and made fashioned something and covered themselves with fig leaves. But that's, that's the first example of man trying to solve the sin problem and provide his own covering, his own solution. But God provided an animal skin to cover them because the, 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 the solution has to come from God, not man. And it's got to be a, a, a death involved and in, in, in a shedding of blood. So all these things are really pictures. I have a playlist I did going from all the way through Genesis to through Revelation, talking about the bloody trail, the blood that was shed in the Bible, all these examples, there's dozens and dozens of them that I mentioned just a couple, but these are all pictures of the blood sacrifice that would be made with Jesus Christ being the Lamb of God. So when John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, this is the one that we see pictured all through the Old Testament, all the animus sacrifices were pictures of this one event that would really be the cure, the one thing that would really work. None of the other animal sacrifices worked. They were just pictures of, of the one to come that would really solve our problem, Jesus Christ. Brother? Brother Luke, I love how you uh, described the thicket and uh, likened it to the crown of thorns around Jesus' head. I've never heard that one. That's a great one. Also, how you describe Abraham's faith. And uh, evidence for that would be also uh, in the place that Abraham named that spot where he was about to sacrifice his son. I don't remember the name, but it was translated as the place that it shall be seen. Okay, and that was the same spot that Jesus was crucified on. Okay, back to you. Yeah, yeah, that's, it, 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 it's just amazing how it just all adds up. Um, and that's why, you know, uh, when I made my videos series, uh, uh, with Paul only used, Paul only isn't debunked. Um, and I challenged the Paulinius uh, interpretation of rightly dividing the word of God. Uh, Brother Joe Byron, uh, I, I really miss him. I, I, keep, I keep mentioning him a lot, but he was, he was just so clever. Uh, he, he was able to coin a phrase that was just perfect. He called me a KJV firstist, okay? He, 
he said that they say to rightly divide the word of God, but in other translations, it says rightly handle it, rightly understand it. But, but what Joe Byron said, he says, Brother Luke, you're teaching how to rightly unite the word of God. Rather than dividing it, the only real division that, that I, I believe we have is the cross. People in the past looking forward to this cross and us looking back at the cross. And even in Hebrews, it says the testament can only begin at the death of the testator. So the Old Testament, New Testament, and what, what separates it, what, what makes it the new one come into effect is that cross, the death of the testator. Uh, but Joe Byron says, Brother Luke, you, you, the term you're, you're, what you're really teaching here is, is how to rightly unite the word of God and show how this is the same message from beginning to end that man cannot make fig leaves and cover himself up and fix his problem. He needs to trust God for salvation. And uh, it's that same message throughout the whole scriptures that, wait, uh, you can't do it by trying to be good and trying to f follow religions and st stuff. And, and, that, that, and here's, some, here's some sacrifices you can do just so you can understand that God's going to provide that lamb. Just as Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb. And he finally provided it here. And John the Baptist, his whole purpose, he didn't save anybody when he's baptizing all the people in the Jordan. None of the people got saved because he was baptizing them. But he pointed to the lamb of God. There he says, there he is. The one I've been telling you is coming. The one the scriptures have been talking about, the Lamb of God. The reason he called the Lamb of God is because, of course, the Jewish people understood what the Lamb of God was. That it, it, it that the Lamb was sacrificed to signify that your sins are atoned. They were only atoned in the past, covered up. But this Lamb was going to pay for the sins. He was, as Brother uh, Aaron Budgen teaches, there's a difference between atoning for sins and propitiation for sins. Atoning is just a temporary covering. It's a temporary solution. But, but, but propitiation is a permanent solution. It's paid for. It's paid in full. It is finished, as Jesus said on the cross. Uh, looks like we have someone here with us. Let me see who that is. Naser, N-A-S-E-R. Naser, can you turn your mic on and say hi? All right, I guess you just want to listen. All right. Uh, okay, brother. Uh, brother Eric, go ahead. Uh, what's your, anything before we go on? Well, Brother Luke, um, I like how you give credit to whom credit is due. And uh, that's really uh, a great policy to uh, adhere to. Now, I'd like to give credit to most of my teachings come from uh, Chuck Missler. And uh, Kent Hovind and uh, Mark Biltz. Okay, and uh, so I'll be uh, a lot of the stuff I'm saying comes from them guys. So you can blame them guys. <laughs> well, I I particularly like uh, Chuck Missler's uh, uh, teaching. Uh, he's he's super smart when it comes to all the scientific uh, an answers. But uh, I just thought of something because Missler sound, sounds like Geisler. And that's the name of the, the, the preacher I was referencing earlier when he was talking about, about um, Acts 3.28. Uh, uh, repent and be baptized. And, you know, and, 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 but the baptism it doesn't, it, it's not referring to water. It's referring to re repent and be immersed be immersed into jesus believe into jesus don't just don't just believe in him as well he he's a real person he really did all these things but believe in him be immersed into him put your faith completely in him and you become in christ and he's in you uh but his name is geisler and what was his first name <sighs> norman no, uh, no, Norman Geisler is another one that, that, but this is a younger version of, of him. His name is Geisler too, but it's a, it's a younger preacher of about ha half of Norman Geisler's age. All right. I'll, maybe I'll think of it later. 
Okay, let me look at uh, the next verse and see if we have time to go on any further. Um, okay. All right, verse 31 says, And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. Verse 32, And John bare record, saying, I saw this spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. Uh, and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Uh, yeah. So let me see, it was in verse uh, 29, he called him the Lamb of God, and then he says that uh, God told him that he, when he saw somebody where the, 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 the Spirit, the Holy Spirit would be uh, hovering above them, that that's the one, that's how you'll know who it is, who you're going to introduce as the Son of God, the Lamb of God. Okay, brother? So then, do you think he's uh, saying that he never grew up and knew his cousin? Is that what he meant when he said he knew him not? Uh, I don't see anything uh, in the scriptures at all that, that tell me that they knew each other, even though they were related. Uh, it, it, on the other hand, though, it seems logical since they didn't live far apart and it's not like he lived hundreds or thousands of miles apart from each other so they they were not accessible and his his mother mary uh his aunt do you remember her name i keep forgetting her name um uh, the mother of john the baptist uh elizabeth yeah elizabeth so mary and elizabeth uh, they seem to be close. It seems logical that they would have known each other, but on the other hand, uh, there's nothing in the scriptures that explicitly states that, that they, uh, Jesus and John the Baptist knew each other. Some people might speculate they were kids. Maybe they grew up around each other and they knew each other. But according to this, it says, I knew him not. So uh, let me read it again. Is verse 31, and I knew him not, but that he should be manifest to Israel. Therefore, am I come baptizing with water? It seems to me that um, if he had known him and knew that, well, this is my cousin, Yeshua, Jesus, uh, he would have, he couldn't say I knew him not. Now you could say I knew him not as far as I didn't know who he would be until I saw the, the Holy Spirit like a dove above him. That's when I knew who it was, who the Messiah, the Christ, the Lamb of God, the Son of God. That's when I knew how, who this person was. But it seems to me that if he knew Jesus as his cousin and then he saw that, hey, that's the one that I'm going to introduce, and it happens to be my cousin. Uh, doesn't it seem logical that he would say, wow, that's my cousin, and, and he's the one. I never realized that. Isn't that amazing? I mean, isn't it natural that he would also say that? Yes, it sounds like he's sort of uh, emphasizing that point without actually saying it when he states twice that he knew him not. Yeah, I don't, uh, so I don't know. I don't really have a, a strong conviction uh, about that. I don't, I don't know. That's the best I can do as far as it, it doesn't, it seems to me that he would have said, hey, uh, I've known him my whole life, I didn't, but I, I, I couldn't have told you he's the Messiah because only now did God reveal it to me because God told me 
that to identify the person, this would be the sign. The spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. That's God said, when I see that, that's how I identify the Lamb of God, the Son of God. And, and uh, so I don't know. I can't really uh, make a conclusion on that. I can't speak strongly again with, uh, you know, one way or the other on it. I'll, I'll go. You want to say anything else before I move on? I'm good. Okay. Uh, I'd like to look at these verses in the Amplified before we go on, just to see the difference, see if it's helpful in any way. I'll read the same series of, of verses here in the Amplified. Uh, Okay, verse 29, I'll start there. It says, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who is who has a higher rank than I and has priority over me, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, uh, but... I came baptizing in water so that he would be publicly revealed to Israel. John gave further evidence, testifying officially for the record with validity and relevance, saying, I have seen the spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this one is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I myself have actually seen that happen, and my testimony is that this is the Son of God. Well, that uh, that certainly kind of that elaborates uh, pretty much the way that we've been discussing it, the, the, the points that we've uh, been uh, elaborating on. The way I've been amplifying the scriptures, it seems like they are amplifying it the same way. And it does seem the way they wrote it, that it says, I did not recognize him. It says, uh, uh, I did not, in verse 31, it says, I did not recognize him as the Messiah. So the way it's phrased there, he could have very well have known Jesus as his cousin and saying, I didn't recognize him. I didn't know he was the Messiah until God told me the one who has the Holy Spirit above them like a dove, that's how you'll know. And now I see it's him. I didn't recognize him before as the Messiah. So you see how it could work uh, even if he had, they had known each other. Yeah, certainly good. Um, all right, let me make a note here. What verse is this so we can pick up next time? Okay, verse 35. So we're going to go with uh, John 1, 35 is where we'll pick up next time. Um, I want to take a couple of minutes now to uh, close with the... Um, Where is it here? Uh, with an invitation to receive the free gift of salvation. You know, I'm, it's, it's my uh, custom. It's, uh, I consider it a requirement. I mean, I cannot neglect what is most important. I mean, if you learn all these things and then we neglected to tell you what's most important, then I would say shame on me. So I, I want to end every broadcast telling you what is most important. And that is uh, what the jailer asked the apostle Paul. When Paul and Silas were in jail, the jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? I mean, saved means that you are spared 
the bad thing that's, that's in your future. The bad thing in everyone's future is you suffer the second death in the lake of fire. That's what the Bible says is waiting for everyone. And if you want to be saved from that fate, do you know what you've got to do so you can be saved? And then in, in addition to being saved from the second death in the lake of fire, rather than go into the lake of fire, you get to go into life everlasting in heaven. Do you know what you need to do to receive the gift of life everlasting in heaven? Most people don't know what they, they must do. Well, when the jailer asked Paul, what must I do? Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, the apostle Paul was a very, very thorough person. He, he wrote uh, about, about half of all the New Testament. And he, he wrote exhaustively explaining theology and everything. And he wasn't one to leave out details. So if anything else was required, other than believing on Jesus Christ, then you'd have to say the apostle Paul was negligent because all he said was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're going to be saved. You get to go to heaven if you believe on Jesus. Now, if that's not true, if more is required, then the Apostle Paul had to either be a liar or negligent because he didn't tell the man the whole, everything that was required. But, uh, and the same thing you could say of, of Jesus. When, when the religious Jews were asking Jesus, they said, well, what, what works does God require of us? And Jesus said, this is the work of God. Believe on the one he sent, me. God sent me. Believe on me. That's what's required. Now, if more was required, like works that they want to know, what do I have to do? Do I have to get water baptized? Do I have to go to the temple? Do I have to do these sacrifices? Do I have to abstain from sin? Do I have to give to charity? Do I have to fast? Do, do I have to give alms? If, if other things were required, then you'd have to say Jesus either didn't know what he's talking about, or Jesus was negligent because Jesus answered like Paul did. Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus answered the same question. What do I have to do? And he said, believe on him who is sent. And Jesus was the one that sent to be our savior. Believe on Jesus. That's what it required. But I find brother that uh, the whole world is ignorant about this. The, all through history and all over the world today, you ask people, what do you have to do so you can go to heaven? And they don't say what Jesus said. They don't say what Paul said. They don't think that believing on Jesus is what's required. It's the one thing you must do. Instead, they come up with a list of other things like, okay, I'm going to join a religion. I'm going to become religious. I'm going to follow all the tenets and rituals of that religion, and I'm going to do good and keep my fingers crossed, hoping it's good enough. That's what people think. They think that you can go to heaven based on your personal merit. If you do enough good, God will judge you as acceptable and you get to go to heaven. But not according to Jesus and Paul. They said, if you want to know what God requires of you, what you must do, believe on Jesus. Put your faith in him. No longer believe in yourself. No longer believe in your own ability, your own effort. Reject that and instead believe on Jesus instead. So who is he? Jesus is eternal God Almighty. He was manifest in the flesh as the Son of God. He became a man and he died for our sins on that cross. Your sins are all paid for. That's what we want you to understand. The, the, the issue between man and God is not sin. Jesus has resolved that issue. When he died on the cross, the temple curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the outer area, that, that, that curtain was there to keep everybody out because they didn't have access to God. But when Jesus died, the curtain was torn wide open, symbolizing that there's no longer a barrier between man and God. The barrier was sin, but Jesus paid for our sin. Now we have all have access to God through Jesus Christ. So he paid for our sins. 
and he died. He was buried, but just for three days. On the third day, he was raised from the dead, and that is the proof that Jesus is God, that he does have power over life and death. And Jesus promises you life everlasting if you'll put your faith in him completely. But you've got to believe in him completely and, and reject that anybody else can get you to heaven or that you could get to heaven on your own merit. Reject all that because believing in Jesus means you're not believing in anything else. You're believing only in him. So put your faith in Jesus now. You'll be saved from the second death in the lake of fire, and you'll receive the gift of eternal life in heaven. Do it right now, please. All right, brother, anything else before I close the broadcast? Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, I pray that everybody will hear the message of the good news of Jesus Christ that was presented here today and act on it today just by simply believing on him okay back to you brother Luke. all right brother eric thank you for joining me again and uh uh everybody please join us um nightly 7 p.m pacific time bless you all in the name of our great savior god jesus christ